Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. It's Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk, sort of in the winter for April the 9th, 2021. Hey, we're sorry. We're a couple days late in getting these videos pushed out. We've been really bu busy here in the office and uh, wanted to get some time when we could go down and visit with a producer and, and have time to spend out there with them. We decided this week to make a return trip down to talk with Sean and Beth Doherty. Uh, we started out doing some videos and, and we went there early last spring uh, to their home farm, but this time we decided to go visit the sister's farm, which if you've been coming to Eastern Ohio Grazing Council uh, pasture walks, we did a pasture walk there at that farm several years ago. They, they rent and lease this farm uh, and, and they have part of their operation up there. Uh, depending on what time of year it is and what they're doing, it depends on what kind of livestock are at the farm. So let's get started. First, kind of an overview of what we were looking at there that day. We're looking at what they've already grazed, what's coming up here, what new growth is there, and now we're kind of transitioning into what's left of the stockpiled grass that they've got uh, yet for this winter. And then you can see the cows down there below. We're going to go visit with them and talk about that group of livestock. This is their uh, sort of growing group of livestock. We'll go visit with the lactating cows here in the future, but uh, this is steers, heifers, uh, the bulls in there, a dry cow, uh, the ram because he's away from the, the sheep flock that's down at their home farm. And so they're, they're sort of a growing, sort of the catch-all sort of group. And uh, they, they graze these guys on, on this stockpile. Uh, we'll talk about their grazing here as we go on, but this is the group that, that's growing although they, they aren't on as high a need as the lactating cows that we'll see here in just a second. We've got a picture of everybody except for the bull there in that last slide. This is a, a Dexter bull. Um, I, I just wanted to talk a minute with with you about cows and, and what they've got there. So the, the Doherty's uh, are basically a dairy operation. They, they hand milk cows um, and, and, and their goals are a little different than most of, of us. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen or didn't see the video that we did with them before, th their goal for the operation is to be sustainable. It's not necessarily production oriented. It's not necessarily profit oriented or profit driven. Um, their, their goal is to be sustainable and to produce the food that they and their family and, and some, some friends uh, need uh, for life in, in general. So um, they're using this Dexter bull. He's, he's rather short in stature. If you've been to the Doherty's before, you know that typically it's dairy type cat, cattle, jerseys, even some Holsteins now and then. Um, but they've been using the Dexter uh, for the last several years uh, to, to breed their cows. And, and they're producing cows that are smaller in stature, sort of more grass based and, and fit their operation a little bit better. And, and I, as I talked to them, you know, I, I, going there over the last several years, you know, we were looking at mostly dairy genetics and now uh, mostly black sort of calves or cows that are coming from the, this Dexter bull. Uh, and, and I realized that uh, the other thing about them is that they're they're producing now family oriented cows and, and marketing family oriented or family cows uh, to other people that want to kind of follow with their model and produce their own milk. And so Sean was telling us that at the beginning of the fall, they take a hard look at what they've got at their operation and, and how much stockpile they've got for the winter. And at that point, they start marketing those cows. Um, they, they only keep the amount of livestock that they know they can graze through the entire winter without having to feed any hay. Now, they have hay and they feed hay if, if we get an ice event or a deep snow event. But other than that, um, they, they right size their operation every fall to be able to match the forages that they're going to have for the winter. This is the water tank that they're currently using. Uh, we always take a look at the water tank and, and what they've got for water. And, and in this situation, we're now into April. Uh, we don't have to worry about water lines freezing as much as we would in January and February. So they went ahead and put their sort of summer water system back to work. Uh, prior to this, the, the livestock will be walking back to some developed spring or some other source of water. But because now we don't have to worry about daily freezes or very hard freezes they went to use in their their summer water system they've got a, a half a barrel here with a top tank float if you know me you know i i don't like those top tank floats 
The reason I don't like them is because I've got too many livestock drinking from that trough for that top tank float to keep up. In their instance, though, they've only got a few livestock in this paddock. That top tank float will work just fine. It will it will flow enough water, and there's enough water quantity in that that barrel trough um, to be able to keep those animals. And this is all fed um, from some totes, some water tote, water collection totes up high on the hill, uh, and and those are filled. Uh, with roof runoff or or with footer drain runoff or footer drainage that, that fills those totes so it's it's sort of a gravity system um, but has a pressurized has a float on it they use hoses to get that far you can use pvc or not pvc pe kind of polyethylene uh, pipe if you so choose but that's how they get water there and they're able to move the water around to fit the pasture we're, we're at a point in the spring where the regrowth is coming the regrowth is coming behind us so it's time to start installing those back fences again. If we don't install back fence, those cows are going to tend to go back and regraze uh, what they've grazed as far as stockpile grass goes. For December, January, February, March, it's okay to not have a back fence. It's not regrowing. We've now entered that phase where that regrowth is starting to come, and we want to put that back fence in to keep the livestock from regrowing or regrazing the growing grass. A quick picture here showing the the grazed versus the ungrazed area and this would be the panic that they'd be moving into next uh, but it just shows uh, that they're going through and they're picking out a lot of that green stuff but they're also picking out a lot of the the old dry um, stockpile in there and that's a very good point to make uh, this spring grass is going to tend to be very washy it's going to tend to be very wet and, and those cows really need some sort of dry forage to go along with it to transition their digestive system uh, from the dry stockpile to the green forage that we're going to see here real soon. Uh, also, a good point to point out that this is probably one of the only times in the year, a stockpile and into this transition, that we really want to, we, we're really going to see that, that stark difference between grazed and ungrazed. Uh, I, I see so many times pictures, and, and we even take them. Of, of a transition or the, the difference between what is grazed and what is not grazed. And really, we, we want that to be very slight in, in most of the year. Most of the grazing time of the year, we want that difference to, to be very slight, to not, not show up, uh, especially in the early grazing and the late grazing in the fall. You, you want those paddocks, the, the grazed and ungrazed, to not look all that much different. But during stockpile grazing or if you're like me and you're grazing really tall forage in the summer, then there is a really stark difference between the grazed and ungrazed area. Fencing system here is uh, poly wire. This particular group has two strands of poly wire around it. Some of you may be looking at that and saying, well, why? I really, really probably would only need one. And for most of the year, they get by with just one strand of poly wire, but they've had some trouble with uh, some scapees and, and them getting out and getting into the next version of stockpile. That's common this time of year uh, with the green growth coming on. This is a time when livestock tend to push fences a little bit more than normal. So they went ahead and start putting a, a second strand up um, just to keep those cows home and keep them trained to the electric fence. Um, just step in posts. And it's interesting to note that, that the Doherty's don't have any permanent fence at this location. So everything is polywire. And so there's a feeder line that comes down that feeds the electricity to these individual pastures from a, a plug-in or a solar box that's mounted typically in, in one location where it's either going to get the most sun or where the, the plug-in electric actually is. It's a good picture showing the future stockpile. And, and for some of us, we're looking at that and saying, well, it's weedy. It is. Um, they, they had very dry conditions like I did last summer. Um, some of these fields hadn't been grazed or hadn't seen livestock since July of the year before. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, it's got a good amount of stockpile in there. Um, we can manage those weeds that are in there later on. We can manage them next year as we're grazing through. They'll probably rotate this area and, and this won't be stockpile next year. So we can manage those weeds uh, further on down the road. But a uh, good picture of what they've got as far as stockpile on this side of the farm left and also the new regrowth coming up into that pasture and and, and it, it's a good picture it's a good picture also for this is part of the problem with stockpile is there's not any real way to manage the weeds 
or the 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 wildflower rose that may grow up in that stockpile. Once we start stockpiling, there's not much we can do about it. We just have to know that we're going to rotate that area and manage that later on. I don't want the focus to, to be taken away from the quality stockpile that's in them on that stuff and, and, and what they've got left to graze and also the new growth coming up in among that stockpile. Now we're sort of transitioning over into their lactating group of cows. You can see that cow sort of grazing stockpile. Uh, there's, I think, four cows in this group. One of them's a nurse cow, so there's a calf uh, in among them that is is feeding off one of those cows. And that's just a picture of the laneway down uh, to their spring development where those cows are watering from. Uh, this group hasn't gone on to a pressurized water. They've got to walk back to the barn uh, twice a day anyway, so it's okay to, for them to have a laneway back to water and then from the water it goes on to the, the milking shed where they milk so that's perfectly fine they they move the, the walkway that that's not in the same place all the time so that they don't get trails so they don't get erosion because of them walking back and forth uh, but a, a good picture of of what they do and how they fence uh, the lactating cows to get back to water and also get back to the milking shed just a picture of them all kind of laying down and ruminating here and and this is about done this is about where they're going to stop grazing with these with these cows as i mentioned before uh they're 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 not making the lactating cows clean up as much of the stockpile as they do or the growing group that we we just saw uh, so this is about it and they'll move on to another field here this afternoon uh here again we've got some all flower rows in there it's just something that we'll take care of we had a long conversation with sean about managing the, the mallflower rows and their their thing is they graze this stockpile around that mallflower rose and then they'll come back out with a, a weed eater with a steel blade and, and clean that mallflower rose off right at the ground and, and their their forage will then kind of shade that out and kind of compete with that mallflower rose there's lots of different managements that we can do to, to solve that but this is just a part of stockpile grass it's something that we have to deal with you're not always going to have a beautiful stand of just pure fescue standing out there uh, for stockpile you're going to get some weeds and we just got to learn to manage around them a great shot of the stockpile they've got yet to go uh, for those lactating cows and here again it's just like the growing group we just looked at um, they'll they'll have stockpile grass right up to the time that they'll have good quantities of new grass and new growth and it'll help those cows transition their digestive system from the stockpiled forage to the new growth that we're gonna be using here real soon. Showing the residue or the aftermath, the grazing, um, they, they have fenced this area back off so that they, the cows aren't regrazing the regrowth, um, but they're leaving an awful lot of stockpiled forage there. And that's perfectly fine. They're trying to keep those cows on a higher nutritional plane so they'll produce milk. So this is kind of what we'd wanna see with stockpiled forage, uh, especially this time of year, where we've got that new growth coming in anyway. Uh, we don't want them to graze down really close. Uh, we want to be able to leave some residue so that that new forage can push through there and, and, and get to sunlight and regrow and start our year off uh, on a good foot. Just one strand poly wire for the lactating cows and good picture of uh, two different kinds of three to one geared reels. They've got a, a, a maxi reel there that holds a lot of poly wire and then a, a, a standard three to one geared reel that holds about 1600 feet of poly wire. But uh, again, all of their fencing is done with poly wire and I do the same thing. I tie knots on the posts, hang the reels right there on the post, especially these fiberglass posts will take that weight and not bend over and touch the ground. Um, but uh, this is just a, a good picture and they've got two different reels uh, because it's two different ways that they're gonna move. They can, they can roll that wire up and move the cows different directions. And that's an important point. If you're gonna do everything with poly wire, you've gotta have the right openings and the right number of reels to make your fencing system work. Sometimes I find it's easier to draw it out on paper just so I know exactly how a certain area needs to be fenced so that I can make that next move or that next week's move if, if I have to. This cow walked right up and started grazing right there in front of us. And a, a, good, a good picture too of, we talked about the genetics, but this cow is a, a Dexter Jersey cross. You can see the Jersey in her face, um, but you can see also that they've kind of plucked at that, that um, weed that's there. And that's perfectly fine. It's forage too as well. Uh, these are smaller snatcher cows. They'll pick at that 
that weed, but just a good picture overall of uh, what the cows are taking, what they're leaving behind, and the fact that there's still a lot of forage there uh, that is good quality and good for them to graze. As we were coming out of the field, there was this one really good cow pie sitting there. And I always think it's funny. We talk about a good, really good cow pie, but just a good cow pie that shows that the cows are getting the quality feed that they need. Um, it's the right proportion, right consistency, right shape, everything. And Beth was able to take a quick video to show you what was going on there. Notice how this cow pie is just teeming with life. It's, it's only April and we've already got all kinds of activity going on in and around it. Some of you may be saying, yeah, it's activity. It might be flies. Well, it might be. Um, we, it, it might be something we have to deal with, but I saw an awful lot of insects in and out and around that cow pie and different kinds of insects. And we have to remember this time of year too, I, I see spiders everywhere. We get spider webs all over everything. And, and that is just an indicator to me of what is going on below the soil surface as well. If we've got spiders, that means that there's bugs there for them to eat. If we've got bugs there, that means that they're living off of other bugs that are in the soil or, or things that are in the soil. And I try to talk with Ethan when we're out running around the field and he's worried about the spiders or the spider web. They say, listen, spiders are the predators. The predators are there because there are bugs there. The bugs are there because our soil is alive and because our soil is producing uh, good microbes and fungi and things that they can live off of. So just a good thing to be able to see. We've got we've got the soil working. We've got the soil microbes and the fungi. We've got the bugs there. We've got the, the spiders to harvest the bugs. And we've got birds, good quantities of birds flying around to eat the flies and the spiders. Just a good picture of soil life and how it works. So for us, this is a, a transition time. If we've grazed stockpile through the entire winter, uh, we've got uh, some different concerns by now because we've got new growth coming up in that stockpile. So it's a transition from that stockpiled forage to new growth. And, and how do we manage that? Well, if we're going to graze through the entire year, we need an area like this that has a massive amount of stockpile on the surface so that those livestock can consume some of that new regrowth, but they're still going to have to consume a lot of that dry stockpile growth. And in this way, we can fence them into smaller paddocks, not cover a very large area. And, and so if we hurt that new regrowth in any way, it's gonna be a very small area of our farm. Uh, if we don't have this massive amount of stockpiled grass out there, we just got a little bit and we've got a lot of new regrowth, we're going to have to cover a large area to get those livestock fed. And they're going to end up harming a lot of that new regrowth. So we've got to make a decision. If we're still on stockpiled grass this time of year, uh, what do we do? Are, are we going to do more harm than good by continuing to graze stockpile? And, and in Sean, the best case, the answer to that is no. In my case, at my own personal farm, I don't have enough stockpile uh, to be able to keep them on stockpile pretty much all the time. So uh, we, we've, we've started moving them really fast, the ones that are still on grass, so that they're not hurting that new regrowth. And we've got a group that we've brought back in and started feeding hay because we just didn't have enough stockpile in there. We were having to give them too big of a paddock and we were afraid of hurting too much of that new regrowth for that field. And these fields that we graze stockpile late in the season like this, we need to also realize that we're going to have to give them a lot more recovery time. In my own operation, I like to let those late graze stockpile fields fully recover before I graze them. These will be the fields that I will mob graze later on. There'll be fields that will probably be in almost full head before I'll get back to them and graze them because I want them to have a chance to fully regrow and, and fully regenerate and fully get over being grazed kind of at a, at a hard period in the spring for, for grass plants or for forage plants. Uh, but also, if, if we're thinking about stockpile grass, this traditionally is our mud time. This is traditionally the time that all of us despise. That's late March, early April is when we really have mud. Really by April, the grass is starting to grow. They're starting to take up water. And so we don't have as much mud, but that late March time is usually the time when we really despise having livestock out there. But this stockpile grass really holds up well. 
um, it, it, especially in this quantity with this massive amount on the soil surface. And, and it's a good way to, to get through this month of mud, I call it, or the month of March, uh, when we typically have a lot of wet and soggy conditions. Having this much stockpile and those heavy roots of those fescue plants really hold up livestock. And as long as we keep them moving, uh, we really don't cause much damage to the forage or to the soil below. I wanted to take some time just to go over a quick overview of what we've seen this winter and what we've talked about with winter feeding. Uh, we're kind of coming to the end of the winter feeding season. I hope that our next videos and even our live pasture walks will be talking about real live growing pasture, but kind of the take home messages from our winter feeding series here. It takes planning. We can't just go out there one day and decide, well, we're done with grass. We're going to go ahead and start feeding hay. Um, there's a lot of things that need to go into this. I mean, we're just at this point now starting to think about where we're going to unroll hay next year for the winter. What areas are we going to stockpile for the winter? What areas are we going to let rest and regrow from this year's stockpile and not use for stockpile next year? So just remember, it takes planning to really make an, in, uh, an influence on our winter feeding systems and, and a, an improvement on our winter feeding systems. So we've talked about heavy use pads. Uh, we've looked at them. They can be gravel or concrete. Uh, if you're thinking about putting in a heavy use pad, please don't hesitate to contact one of us, Salt and Water NRCS folks, to talk about the design, the slope, all the different management considerations that go into a heavy use pad. I've got some ideas. I've got some standard sort of drawings for what I would build for a heavy use pad in a perfect world if we were just starting with a blank slate and we'd love to work with you on that. Uh, if we're, we can unroll hay, we talked about unrolling or bale processing and feeding it out in the wind rail. Um, there's no shame in, in feeding hay out there on the field as a fertility program. I mean, unrolling hay is a great fertility program. We roll it out there and it gets fed in an area sometimes where we've harvested hay or sometimes where we just need the fertility. And that's the one one good thing about feeding hay. It is it is a fertility program. It brings fertility either into our farm or into a field where we may need it. And it's the one good reason to feed hay is because we're bringing that 20 to $40 worth of fertility per ton of hay onto our farm or into a field that really needs it. And then we've looked at stockpile grass. And, and I've talked about, I think stockpile grass is the way to go. I think it's it's what we need to do. I think that we all need to think about getting more stockpile forage out there and grazing our livestock more through the winter. I think we would all be happier with it. I think it solves a lot of our winter feeding problems. Although I will say there are times we need a heavy use pad. There are times when we like to unroll hay for fertility reasons. So what is the best system for winter feeding? All of them, all of them combined make a good winter feeding system. We kind of have to use all of them to make them work. Would I prefer to rely on stockpile forage? I sure would. But I also don't want to live in a world where I don't have a heavy use pad to use if things got really muddy or if we got really frozen or really ice covered. I got an area I can clean and put the livestock on. It's also an area that I can bring the livestock in just about any time of the year if I need to catch them. Would I like to want to live in a world where I can't unroll hay? No, I, I love to unroll hay on fields that need the fertility and areas that need the fertility. Even if I'm stockpile grazing, I'll pick an area out that is low fertility and put a bale ring out there or unroll some hay just so they've got some dry forage along with their stockpile grass. So all of these systems work great for winter feeding. And I think the best systems combine all of them together to help us get through the winter without causing damage to our forage, our soil, and our livestock. So as we wrap up winter feeding, we're moving into that new forage and that new growth. We've all got to be careful about turnout. Turnout is going to happen here real soon. Some of you may already have turned out. Uh, I prefer to let the forage get to at least four to six inches before I turn livestock out. Uh, I also prefer to watch the weather and know what's coming. Last year I turned out and two weeks later we got a real cold snap and that really set the forage back. And I really sort of overgrazed a lot of fields. And that really didn't help me when it got dry later in the summer. I'd already kind of stressed those plants and they never really fully recovered when it got dry and that hurt me in the long run. So I prefer to leave it grow four or six inches. I know there are a lot of folks out there and there's a lot of guidance now that's saying with forage plants, orchard grass, grass plants, 
to get to that second and third leaf stage. Time will tell whether that's correct uh, or not. I, I'm going to try some fields and see how they go. My concern is if we wait too long, then we're going to be dealing with seed heads too early and too fast. Uh, but we don't want to overgraze those fields early on in the year. And for some of us that left a, a lot of forage in the field last year, and I'll talk with Kevin about this, he's got really great growth early this spring because he left a, a tall residue going into the fall. And that's something we need to look at and we need to consider. I think we can really hurt ourselves in the fall by grazing things a little too close. We get an extra week of grazing, but it hurts us two weeks of grazing the next spring. So something to consider this time of year, making sure we get good grazing heights out there. We're not grazing too short. We're not turning out too early. Just because it's 70 degrees, 80 degrees during the day doesn't mean the forage is ready to grow. Doesn't mean that the, if the cows are bawling and wanting out, it doesn't mean that they know best. Uh, we need to be the manager in this situation. We need to manage our forage correctly. The other thing I wanted to point out was, I don't know whether you all are seeing it, but I am seeing a ton of clover this spring. In the fields that I've walked and the places I've been, uh, some of it is, as Sean and, and Beth and I talked, it, it was because the soil recognizes the need for nitrogen. And so we've got some clover plant, plants coming up. Uh, I've also noticed areas that we've cross seeded. Some of them are really full of clover and some of them not so much. And I don't know whether you all are seeing that, but it's always interesting to me in the spring to see how the clover really responds and, and where it comes up. We have years where really good years for clover. I don't know whether that's one of these years or this is one of those years just yet, uh, but it sure seems like it is. It sure seems like there's an awful lot of new clover growth out there. So. Pay attention to your beginning grazing heights. Don't turn those livestock out until we get to four or six inches, maybe that two to three leaf stage on the grass. Uh, you'll thank yourself in the long run. Well, that's a wrap for this week's virtual pasture walk. We do thank you all for tuning in. I do want to say again, I, I'm sorry for not getting the video out here sooner. We were just really busy and I'm sorry for doing it in a hurry, but wanted to get good information out to all of you. And the last thing we've kind of thought about is uh, we know that we're picking up some viewers uh, that are outside of our area or outside of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council's traditional attendees. And so Beth and I want to include our email address on this last slide. Uh, we'll include it in the Facebook posts and also in the YouTube uh, video or, or comments section in the video. Uh, because if you're not getting our flyers for our Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to get you on that email list so that you get the flyers for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. We'd love to have you. We'd, we'd love to have attendance from outside the area or from people that don't normally attend our Eastern Ohio Grazing events. We are really looking forward to going back to in-person pasture walks and seeing all of you and the networking that all that brings. There is nothing like getting together with a like-minded group of individuals and really learning about forage and, and to make our operations better. So with that, I'll say we'll see you next time.